doubtful, confused, dejected. That's a fair description of the two disciples of the Lord Jesus who late on the afternoon of Easter Sunday were walking from Jerusalem to the village of Emmaus about seven miles away. Only one of the two men is identified by name. He is called Cleopas. And some ancient authorities identified him as a brother of St. Joseph, foster father of the Lord Jesus. But whoever he was, Cleopas and his companion were debating as they walked and trying to sort out the outrageous and unbelievable claim that Jesus, whom they knew had died on Friday afternoon, was alive on Sunday morning. As they walked and talked, a stranger joined the two men on the road and asked them about their conversation. Luke tells us that at his question, the two men stopped. They just stopped in the road and looked downcast. They were unutterably sad because they thought that Jesus of Nazareth was the long-awaited Messiah who would redeem Israel, and they knew him to be a prophet who was mighty in both word and deed. But at the instigation of the chief priests and public authorities, he was falsely accused, unjustly condemned, and executed in the agonizing and humiliating way preferred by imperial Rome, crucifixion. From the details these men gave to Jesus, it is obvious that they knew him well and that they also knew the apostles and the many other disciples who followed the Lord. And let's assume for the moment that Cleopas was indeed the brother of Mary's husband, Joseph. He would have known Jesus his entire life. Why then did these two men not recognize Jesus the instant he joined them on the way? Luke tells us, And it happened that while they were conversing and debating, Jesus himself drew near and walked with them, but their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. Their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. It seems that the risen Lord deliberately kept them from recognizing him, someone they knew intimately, precisely so that they, and we, could learn how to see him in the means he would leave to remain present in his church from the time of his ascension until the last day. And those means are the inspired word of God and the seven sacraments of the new and everlasting covenant. When the two men explained to Jesus why they were confounded by the events in Jerusalem, he gently rebuked their lack of faith and understanding before teaching them where to find a sure guide in perplexity. Oh, how foolish you are! How slow of heart to believe all that the prophets spoke! Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then St. Luke tells us, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them what referred to him in all the scriptures. In other words, Jesus taught these two disciples that they could not recognize, accept, and understand him unless they knew and understood the law and the prophets, what we now call the Old Testament. Ignorance of the scriptures is ignorance of Christ, the Old Testament no less than the new. One of the very best ways to help seek faith in Christ for those who do not yet have that gift is to help them read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest the Holy Scriptures. After they recognized Jesus at the end of this Emmaus encounter, the two men exclaimed, Were not our hearts burning within us while he spoke to us on the way and opened the Scriptures to us? That is the fire of the Holy Spirit, which opens our hearts and minds to receive with saving faith the grace of believing God's inspired word as the supernatural gift of divine revelation. Then Luke tells us that as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus gave the impression that he was going on farther. This point is crucial for all Christian discipleship. 
The Lord Jesus never forces himself on anyone. He is, of course, the eternal word by whom and for whom all things were made. He is the Pantocrator, the ruler of the universe. But he will not force himself on anyone, because that would make us his slaves rather than his friends. So he waits for their invitation and for ours. Stay with us. And then he does. We all know someone whom we love, but who is not yet a Christian. And we pray for their conversion. Perhaps they are already baptized, but living as though Jesus Christ is not Lord. And this pierces our hearts. But Christ will not force himself on anyone, and neither can we force him on anyone. He waits for an invitation, even as he may open hearts and minds by the fire of the Holy Spirit to receive the truth of the gospel. And in this, we can be instruments of grace by helping someone to understand the Holy Scriptures. But each and every person is free to say, stay with us or not. And so Christ waits. When the two disciples asked him to remain with them that evening, Jesus did go in, and at table he took bread, said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to them. In that instant, they both recognized him, and he was taken from their sight. Once we know Christ in the sacred scriptures, then we can see him in the most holy Eucharist and rejoice in the friendship of the risen Lord Jesus, who forgives our sins and restores us to the dignity of the children of God. But once we know that Jesus Christ is Lord, we cannot keep that good news to ourselves. Despite the late hour and the seven miles, the two disciples set out at once and returned to Jerusalem, where they found gathered together the eleven and those with them who were saying, The Lord has truly been raised and has appeared to Simon. Then the two recounted what had taken place on the way and how he was made known to them in the breaking of bread. Our personal experience of the risen Lord always comes from and leads back to his church, which is the steward of both the scriptures and the sacraments. And in the church, the authentic touchstone of the proclamation of the gospel is the witness of Simon, the rock on whom Christ built his church. The apostolic authority to teach, sanctify, and govern the church is from the very first day of Christ's resurrection, the guarantor that in word and sacrament we meet and adore the true Lord rather than get lost in our own ideas about who Jesus is or should be and then descend into the confusion and doubts that first caused such sadness in the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. It is folly to imagine that we can know and love the Lord Jesus apart from his church, apart from the Bible, and apart from the sacraments. And even when the church is in chaos, as she very often is, the pattern of authentic Christian discipleship established by the Lord himself remains the same in every age. Notice that when the two men rushing back from Emmaus arrive in Jerusalem, they find the eleven, not the twelve. Judas betrayed Jesus and then murdered himself on Good Friday. But even the abject failure and faithless despair of an apostle does not diminish the power of the church's witness to the resurrection, whether he is Judas Iscariot or Ted McCarrick. In the first lesson this morning from chapter 2 of the Acts of the Apostles, we read of St. Peter's first proclamation of the risen Lord Jesus on the day of Pentecost. Simon, who ran for his life and denied three times even knowing the Lord, now emerges as Peter, who explains the meaning of the scriptures and preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ with the conviction and power that will carry the church in one generation from Jerusalem to the ends of the empire. 
And that urge to proclaim Christ crucified and risen should fill the hearts of everyone who recognizes the Lord Jesus in the scriptures and the breaking of bread. Because Christ is risen. Truly he is risen. Alleluia. Alleluia.